Well, good morning. Welcome to Scutney Union Church. My name is Michael Boy. I'm the pastor here. We uh, just as far as a couple announcements going. Um, all right. So two weeks ago, we had three people share the live stream. So what you do is you get either on your computer or on your phone, and you hit that share button, and it goes on your wall. And we have we had like 500 views two weeks ago. Last week we had one person share and we only had like 150 views. <laughs> so if people share, we'll have a lot more views. And uh, the only purpose of getting more views is to become famous and start a television ministry. No, no, it's just about sharing uh, so people can uh, potentially hear the gospel. And that's, that's what we're trying to do. Anyway, so... Um, yeah, so if you have a phone or if you're at home or whatever and you would share, if you would like to share it, we would appreciate if you did, and um, that way more can get spread out there. Anyway, Tuesday, it was the second week of our class. We had our first class this past Tuesday. It went, uh, I think it went fairly well. Um, we have the uh, free version of Zoom, so it only lasts like 40 minutes, so that makes me speak quickly. Um, or just not cover a whole lot of information so um, we can have some discussion. Uh, but anyway, uh, we actually had a little bit of a post discussion after the Zoom, so if you're able to show up, uh, you get a little extra at the end uh, because Zoom can't cut us off from that. But anyway, so Tuesday, 6.30, um, we will, I'm sure we're using the same key for Zoom as we've used the previous because we I've scheduled them for the next five weeks. So um, if you'd like to join and you haven't gotten an email with it, please let me know. All right, is there any other announcements we need to make? Anything that we need to make? Oh, I think we do have the annual meeting, right? I got to make that. And that's, sorry, let me look at uh, what the date is. The, uh, I'm sorry, what was it? Two weeks from today, which is the 31st, January 31st, Sunday, two weeks from now, we have the church's annual meeting. So what we're going to do is, because obviously because of the pandemic, um, if people like to show up, obviously that's fine. Uh, but we'll also be um, using Zoom again. So anyway, it's um, we'll send out an email. I'll be sending out an email this week to all the church people that I have emails for. Um, so need to make that announcement. All right, anything else? All right. Uh, the first song we're going to sing is Cry Out to Jesus. So. Stop the faith in love And they 
first scripture comes from Psalm 84. I'm just going to read the uh, whole chapter. <clears throat> How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of heaven's armies. I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the court of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. Even the sparrows find a home. And the swallows build their nest and raise their young. At the place near your altar, O Lord of heaven's army, my King and my God, what joy for those who can live in your house, always singing your praises. What joy for those whose strength comes from the Lord, who have set their minds in a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. When they walk through the valley of weeping, it will become a place of refreshing springs. The autumn rains will clothe it with blessings. They will continue to grow stronger, and each of them will appear before God in Jerusalem. O Lord God of heaven's army, hear my prayer. Listen, O God of Jacob. O God, look with favor upon the king, our shield. Show favor to the ones you have anointed. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a gatekeeper in the house of my God than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will uphold no good thing from those who do what is right. O Lord of heaven's army, what joy for those who trust in you. May God bless the reading of his word. We're going to continue worshiping by singing, uh, Blessed Be Your Name. And then enough. Yes. 
All right. We uh, yesterday I um, was uh, officiated or led a memorial. We've been praying for Gloria Shampney, which is uh, Doreen Studley's mother-in-law. Um, and yeah, so um, be praying for the family, um, which includes uh, those who come to church like Doreen and Dorsley family and others, um, Elizabeth. Just pray for their family as they uh, mourn the loss of their uh, mother, grandmother, and even great-grandmother. So. Um, all right, what else? Other prayer requests that we have? Yes. So let's pray for this young couple who um, became expecting parents, and uh, the doctors say that there seems to be some heart issues, so the uh, baby probably will not survive more than a couple more days. So uh, be praying for that couple and uh, the heart uh, ache that they uh, experience, and of course, you know, God is a God of miracles, so we'll see, but we'll definitely be praying for them. Thanks, Cookie. Cookie. So a family friend, Dolly, who was actually in a head-on collision, uh, so thank God she's, you know, alive and all, but she's going through, uh, obviously, some real pain, uh, but nothing serious, I guess, that they know of? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we thank God for that. Oh, serious? There was a new car? <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. So, all right. So let's be praying for Dolly and her new car. Okay. Uh, continue to pray. Uh, Rob and my sister mentioned uh, Hugh, my brother, who has stomach pain. Uh, he's the one who is dealing with this uh, uh, tumor. So we praying. He has uh, MRI, so he's waiting to get results to see if that tumor is continuing to st be stable, uh, shrink, or grow. So we're praying that uh, the results would be uh, negative for the results, positive for him and uh, for the family, so and for his stomach pain as well. And then uh, Henry mentioned uh, Crystal, who was a, a friend I, and I believe a neighbor uh, who is currently on dialysis, uh, I think two or three times a week, he said. So be praying that um, her kidneys uh, will get back to uh, functioning well. So be praying for Chris, continue to pray for Crystal. Anything else? Lynn? Do you have a first name for him? Ed? All right, so um, Lynn's friend Ed, who's in Florida, just uh, discovered he has stage four cancer in his pancreatic, uh, which is a very difficult one. So we'll be praying for Ed and his health and his spirit as well. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, Anna Alicia has a praise that it's actually sunny in Vermont. Yeah, we like the sun. <sighs> Megan. Uh, 
Yeah, so uh, especially up here, uh, we have a lot of people who suffer from that sad uh, disorder, the seasonal affect disorder, and um, and then those who are dealing with addiction disorders and uh, other mental health issues that they would, uh, during this time, it's very difficult, so be praying for them as well. Flo Ann. Yeah, yeah, we always need to be praying for the country, that's for sure. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's crazy times. So let's be, yeah, we're, we definitely need to be praying. All right, let's pray. God, we, um, we thank you that we are able to, uh, those of us who have come to that point in our lives where we can call you Abba Father, where you are our dad, you are our, um, not only you're the king, the creator, but you are a personal, intimate God who loves us and allows that intimacy, which uh, as humans on our end, um, sometimes it just seems strange. You are a, um, a terrifying figure when we understand your strength and your power and your justice, but as we be learn to understand and appreciate more and more your love and your uh, grace and your mercy, um, this perfect balance of all of that, that because of Christ, we now um, come freely and boldly into your presence. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful and it's amazing, and I just pray, God, that we would take those opportunities to come to you and that Jesus as a mediator can, when there's times when we cannot express either our fears or our frustrations or um, issues and problems, we have no answer. And sometimes we don't even know how to ask that Christ mediates and, and, and expresses to the Father our, our deepest desires. And you hear and you listen and you welcome it. May we take time each day to share our relationship, our lives with you and that we will become closer and more intimate with you. And for all these requests that we have, and each week we, we present requests, but as we do this, Lord, we, we want to be reminded you are this, you are God that um, it's, it's amazing how different you are than us. And I know it seems uh, at times obvious, but um, we oftentimes think of you in terms of human traits and you are so beyond us yet you do have these traits that um, care deeply no matter how small the request is or no matter how large it is and um, and this ongoing um, presence in our lives that you want to hear those frustrations in our lives and you want to and you, and you cry with us when we cry, and you, and you celebrate when we celebrate, and it's this amazing, amazing relationship and, and an honor, and it's so humbling to know that you care about all of that. So as we present requests, help us not to simply think of you as either a big Santa Claus or a big genie in the sky that just gives us things, but that you're actually a God who loves and wants intimacy with us and that we share our lives. Um, so this morning we, we present that, that each of us would give us, give you our lives, and that we would um, walk and follow and serve and enjoy you. Um, for the, the Champney, family, uh, Champney family, Lord, excuse me, uh, that has lost their uh, mother and sister and grandmother and great-grandmother, we pray for this whole family that they would uh, experience your uh, peace in the midst of this hurt and that you would fill, uh, you would turn their sorrow into joy, Lord, we ask. For this uh, young couple that Cookie mentioned that um, was pregnant and now this, um, uh, this little one has uh, heart problems and uh, they, they, they seem to believe that they won't lie, uh, this, this, this young and I know it's so hard for parents to go through this, and I pray for this little one uh, that you could pr perform a miracle in their lives, but we also just pray 
for the, uh, the family and for the mom and the dad as they uh, struggle through the, the heartache of uh, potential loss. Um, be with their soul. Be with them, God, in this time. Uh, we pray for uh, Dolly as she's been in this head-on collision, that you would give her, um, give her full health, help there not to be any other issues potentially, but that uh, as she deals with pain, that you would give her strength and uh, complete and total healing and uh, that the insurance would uh, serve her well with the collision of her new car. We pray for uh, Hugh as he's been exter uh, experiencing stomach pain, and um, it's just this struggle in, in, in dealing with this cancer, and I pray, God, that uh, you would continue to help the treatments that he's going through to be successful, and uh, we pray for uh, good results from this MRI, and, uh, Lord, that he would continue to uh, seek your face, that he uh, continue to open his heart to you and that you would continue to lead him and uh, help him to uh, strengthen and understand who you are even, even more. Uh, Lord, we pray for um, Crystal as she is on dialysis several times a week. Uh, we pray, Lord, that for complete healing of uh, the infection that affected her um, kidneys and, uh, Lord, that it would, uh, she would heal completely, God. By your grace, we pray. For Lynn's friend, Ed, who has found out he has stage 4 pancreatic cancer, God, give him strength, give him in his spirit, give him uh, hope, that uh, uh, knowledge. We always, every time we pray, we pray for miracles, but we all know that uh, this life uh, is but a vapor that appears for a while and then vanishes. And we know that this body that we live in someday is going to uh, just, in essence, stop working. And I just pray that you would be with Ed as he's facing this potential, that you would increase his faith, increase his strength and uh, leaning upon you, and that he would have joy in the midst of all of it, um, no matter how uh, you deem uh, whether this is um, a struggle that he will survive or not. God, that you will be glorified and he would, he would be filled with hope and peace. Lord, we thank you for the sunshine that we're experiencing here. And I know it's a big deal for a lot of people who suffer from um, the sad disorder and uh, different dis uh, addiction disorders and mental health issues. And it's, it's, it's just very difficult. And, and on top of that, we have this uh, pandemic where a lot of our people are being isolated and groups like um, Alcoholics Anonymous and NA and all those are they're not meeting in person, and so a lot of people who are struggling are struggling even more so than normal. And uh, so all of this, God, I pray that you would bring healing and uh, hope into the lives of those who are hurting and uh, who feel desperate. And we pray for our nation, Lord, as there's a lot of uh, chaos, and um, we, uh, for uh, as long as I can remember in my life, um, there's always been this hope in a politician or a political party or whatever it might be, and we realize, well, you'd think we would realize that after a while that our hope isn't in uh, a person except for the person of Christ. And uh, there's no guarantee that this nation is going to remain free or uh, that we have the ability to continue to meet together as believers openly and freely. And There's all these things that could potentially happen or not, um, you haven't guaranteed any of that for any of us. We don't know what the future holds except that you are God and you are in charge. And I pray, Lord, that as we ask for protection and as we ask that this nation would continue to be a nation that is just and right or would <laughs> become more that way, um, depending on who you are and your experiences, uh, I just ask, God, that you would help us to turn to you and that each one of us would share your love, and that you would change hearts, and that those who are in power, Lord, that you would turn their hearts from the desire for more power to a desire to serve you and to serve others. And those who are um, greedy and always looking for more and to uh, cut corners and to hurt people, Lord, that you would change their heart through the gospel, and that we would see a mighty working of your spirit in this nation, and that that would spread throughout the whole uh, globe. Lord, we love you. I feel like we have no choice but to trust you, but I know we do have a choice. 
And um, I can't imagine my life without you. And I pray, Lord, that each day I myself would draw closer to you and learn to love more and that that would affect the people that I meet. And I pray that for each one of us, Lord, that we would have a true love effect on those who we bump into every day. And now, Lord, just give us a united heart, a united mind as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we're continuing uh, in Colossians. And uh, last week I, we read Colossians 1 and we read uh, what's titled The Supremacy of Christ. Then we read from verses 15 uh, down to verse 20. And uh, at the end of that verse 20, he says, uh, Paul says, he made, this is Jesus, he made peace with everything, excuse me, God, he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. And then in verse 21, it says, and this is where we pick up, this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in this physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news is that, <coughs> excuse me, the good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. This is such a great passage. Colossians is actually really, uh, Paul did amazing work uh, as he wrote this. And it, uh, as I was preparing for this sermon, it, I was reminded of this situation at my, when I was a kid, and I was very, very young. Um, I may not have been any older than my grandson, Mikey. I don't know for sure. I was pretty young, though. I was probably around, I think I was around five years old. I can't remember. But all I know is, is that um, my mom always told us if we did something bad and it's time to get disciplined, and my parents were firm believers in corporal punishment, never to run. <laughs> that is a no-no. <laughs> Do not run from mama and I remember and I can't well I don't remember exactly what happened I just remember that my mom if I remember correctly my mom yelled something about okay who did this and I had that split second moment where I had to make a decision I either stand there and lie <laughs> and say it was someone else I, s I stand there and I said it was me, I did it, which was the truth, or I run. And I chose number three. <laughs> and I decided to run. And I knew that my mom was, you know, she was probably middle-aged. I don't know how old she was at the time. She seemed a little chunky to me. So I'm sure as a five-year-old, I could be outrunning her just like, I mean, I knew I watched The Bionic Man. I knew that... I had it in me. I've had dreams of running 60 miles an hour, right, as a kid. So I start what I know is going to be my escape. And within, I don't know, probably two seconds, I feel a hand on my shoulder and my arm. And I look up, and there's Mama. And Mama ain't happy. She goes, are you, are you trying to run? And I'm like, no. My mom was very upset with me. Right, because she probably had to go a few feet to catch me. And she said, go upstairs, I'll be up there in a minute. And my two wonderful sisters, who were my big sisters, took pity upon me. And they devised a plan, because Mama was very upset. So they started 
with my long johns, and we put on every pair of long johns that existed in the house. And so I, re I just remember layers of long johns, and I'm like, hey, this is going to work. I'm going to have padding. This is going to work. And I, I don't remember how many I had, but I think I put my mom's pants on after that because they were huge, and I waddled down the stairs toward the executioner. I don't know what my mom was thinking, if she laughed within herself or what, but all I remember is she said, all I know is you better take all that off. And that's all I'm going to say is what happened. <laughs> um, I don't want to get, <laughs> I mean, it happened, what, 50 years ago? Um, yeah, but when mama ain't happy, uh, there can be some trouble, right? And I, and I think back on my life as a child, and I think back to when my brother would do something that was wrong and make me upset. And I remember thinking, my parents need to take him back behind the garage and give him a good whooping because he deserves it. Because he's like, well, I mean, I'm a pretty good kid. But my brother, he was hell on feet, you know. And so in my mind, I figured he deserved it while I didn't. And that's kind of that relationship we have with our siblings. And I remember thinking as a kid, you know, maybe if my mom was a little harder on my brother, he wouldn't have gotten in so much trouble. Or maybe if my dad wasn't hard, like, I can't believe they put up with that stuff. And I would think all these things about my sibling. And then I became a parent. I became a dad, and I'm like, everything changes. My relationship with my kids was totally different than my relationship with my siblings and my relationship with my parents. It's, it totally changed. Like, I could not, and I've talked about this a little bit, but I could not believe that when that baby shriveled up and looking god-awful, coming out of the womb, misshapen head, most likely, I just immediately fell in love. It was like there was no visible, except we had a couple of sonograms back in the day. We look at it and say, wow, that's beautiful. And you'd see the spine and, you know. And that baby, I had four of them. And after the first one, I remember thinking like, wow, I, I love her completely. I love her. I just love her absolutely, right? And then... My son came, my firstborn son came, and I remember, like, I love him completely. It's like, how is this possible that I can love both of them completely? Well, then the twins came, and I'm like, well, now we're just toast. You know, now we're in big trouble. But then the twins come, and you're like, how is it possible that I have love for each of my children equally? It doesn't seem to make sense because you would think there's a limit. And there's only so much love to give out, but it's like I, I could have, thank God I didn't, but I could have more. And I'm pretty confident, and I'm, I'm very confident that somehow this love within me grows in such a way that each of my kids I love completely. It doesn't mean as they grew up that I liked them every moment of the day equally. Because Sometimes they did things that really upset me. And I'm thinking, I don't like this kid right now. I want them to go in the room, and I don't want to see them right now because they're so angry. But it never changed my love. You see, the whole time, whatever we did to try to be the parents that we needed to be, Every time we try to discipline them the way we believe God wanted us to discipline them, to train them up, it was all done out of love, 100%. Now, as a human being, there were times when I would get angry. And I have to confess, there were times when I disciplined out of anger. Now, God convicted me of that. God said, no, don't do it that way. It's not about you. It's about them. If you're angry... Take some time to cool off and come back and deal with it. I said things where I had to go back and to apologize to my children because the things I said to them were not right. They were 
unjust. It was personal, you know? And I said things that would be hurtful to them because I was upset and I felt justified because I am a sinful human being as a dad. And so I had to go back and to apologize to them and say, I shouldn't have said that. It doesn't matter if you deserved it, okay, because what I said was inappropriate. And I'm sorry I called you that name. I'm sorry I called you a jerk or whatever. You're my child and I love you. And I want you to know that even when you act like that, all right, I still love you. I just want you to learn how to live life abundantly with God in your, in your life and, and to learn how to live free and all those things, you know. And so you want your kid to be successful and so you grow up and you, and you just pray to God that they've learned. And then, you know, some, some of us, <laughs> I remember I had a, a guy in my church, in one of the churches I worked in, and he was, he was like Stalin in his home. And he was like, you know, uh, if my son uh, ever does anything wrong, I basically take his door off his bedroom and then I rid it, you know. And he's telling me all, he's just bragging about all these very, very over-the-top sometimes things that he would do. Some of them were probably good ideas and others were over the top. But he sat there and talked about my kid will never do that while they're in my home. Once they're 18 and they're out of the house, well, my job was done. I did, you see, and I'm thinking to myself, this sounds like this is about him, not about them. It's about his name as a parent. Is his name going to go down in infamy? Are they going to write a newspaper article and show his picture with his family and say, look at the amazing family I have because I have worked so hard at this and I have done what I've had to do. And then you walk around really proud of how amazing your children are because you've done such an amazing job. And then on the other hand, if, they, <laughs> if you see failing in a child's life, you roll back and you're like, ha, where did I go wrong? What did I do wrong? Then you're starting to think back. and It's like, what could I have done differently? If I could go back and do it differently, could I do it differently? What would I do differently? And you rack your brain and God's like, wow. You humans are a mess. You're either, you're either egotistical and proud or you're down in the dumps. Like, come on, guys, it's me. This is me. I'm God. And so what we do, though, and this is the beauty of what Paul is saying here, what we tend to do, almost all of us, is we try, and I, I've said this a few times in the past couple of weeks, we try to create God in our image. We want God to behave the way we behave. So when we read scripture and when we live life, we tend to designate qualities to God that we have. And so when we talk about fearing, the Bible talks about fearing God, we think we need to run away from God if we're bad. Because he's scary. It's like when mama ain't happy, you better run because if you get caught, you in deep trouble. And it's like, no. I mean, we, we've, we, we've talked about Adam and Eve and, and, and when they disobeyed. And Genesis is the story of the first people. There was only one thing, man, one thing they weren't allowed to do, and that was eat from this tree in the middle of the garden. I'm not going to get into all of this, but it's like, all right, God, really? You put the one thing they can't do in the middle, Right? It's like it's, they walk by it every day. They're looking at it every day. It probably had more fruit than any other tree in the garden. And it was just all this fruit hanging down, and it looks delicious. It's like, well, no. Daddy said not to uh, eat. It's all good. The serpent comes, beguiles Eve. She eats it. Adam comes by. He eats it. And what do they do? They run. They hear God, and they run. This is what humans do. We run. And God's like, wait, where are you going? You don't think God, of course God knew what happened. It doesn't say he came in tearing down trees as he's walking. Where are you? You know, and like that's the image sometimes we get of who God is. It's like, how dare you? And then he's like, you know, and he's destroying it's like Godzilla right like no that's not what God did he was walking in the garden he's like Adam where, where are you guys uh well 
we're naked, God. So we hid ourselves. Who told you we're naked? Ah, I was afraid he was going to ask me that. They were busted, right? But God isn't, he's not like, he's not screaming at them. He's not slapping them around. He's like, listen, why? I gave you a choice to eat or not. You chose to eat. Okay, let's deal with this. There's consequences. But God loved them. The, he, he disciplined them. He took them out of the garden. He clothed them. And we see the beginning of this relationship that God has with humanity. But over and over and over again, we see God is this terrifying figure that we have to run from. And even today, there are people who come to church. They start coming to church, and, then, and, and they seem pretty excited about living for God. And then something comes up. Something happens, and in their heart they feel guilt and shame because of what they've done. And inevitably they run. And I, and I call them, or I text them. I'm like, hey, what's up? Haven't seen you in a while. No answer. Hey, what's going on? What, you know, uh, can, can we meet for coffee? Can we just connect? busy right now and then you find out that this thing has happened and it's like when did I ever say that you shouldn't be here when have I ever like when did I ever judge like no there's no judgment here it's just like listen that the times that you need us <laughs> we need each other most is when we do dumb things right but that's the times when we run because inside us, we're, we're feeling that shame that Adam and Eve felt, the shame that, that separates us from each other, and we try to clothe ourselves with fig leaves, which doesn't do a very good job. And we hide out from God, and we hide out from other people. And Paul says, listen, this what Christ has done to reconcile us with God? Let me just say this. God does not have a problem with us. We have a problem with God. I want you all to understand that this is hugely important, that God knows that we're human. Listen, it doesn't mean that he approves of everything that we do. On the contrary, he created us in a way that he knows that there's certain things that when we do them, it's going to hurt us. It's going to hurt our bodies. It will hurt our souls. It will hurt our minds. And people oftentimes will want to live the way they want to live regardless because they believe this is what they want. And I don't care what God says, I don't care what anyone else says. And like a parent, when my kids or my grandchild does something that I know isn't healthy for them, I, in love, I'm going to say, this isn't good. I don't just start beating them up. No. I don't, I don't want to hurt them because they've enraged me. No. I love them. And it's like if I'm a sinful Human parent, how much more is God? And so Paul says, listen, but the thing is, he has reconciled you to himself through Christ's death. This death that Jesus paid for us, God the Son coming in human form to walk our walk and to die on the cross for us, right? To redeem us. We have this five-cent tax we get on cans and bottles in Vermont. It's ridiculous, right? It costs me more money, right, to go and get cans and bottles. Vermont passed a recycling law that demands everybody recycle for free. So we do recycling once every two weeks here, which is always overrunning. I don't know about anyone else around here. But those of us who live in Vermont, our recycling bin is all, because most everything's recyclable, right? And it's just this huge amount of recycling. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't they get rid of the five-cent deposit? We have to recycle anyway. Well, that's an easy one when you find out that they make millions of dollars off of people saying, I don't want to deal with this redemption thing. And they just put it in a recycling bin. <laughs> and so all that money that's being made in Vermont, you know, I, I, you know it's like when we lived in Brooklyn, the Verrazano Bridge. It was like, I think it was like, I think it started out like at $4. I think it's like 16 now or something, some crazy thing. And they said, we will get rid of the toll as soon as the, it's paid for. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 no. That's been like 30 years ago. 
or more, more than that, like probably 50 years ago now. And of course, the toll never left, and it just keeps going up and up and up and up, because that's what, there's a value there, right? The only value that we have to God is the value that we are who we are. Not to be used, not to be manipulated, but to have relationship with. He loves us. And he said, I want to reconcile because you keep running away from me. I'm going to send Jesus to make you stop running and turn to me and say, I want to boldly come to God because now I see God's love. I, I see what Jesus was willing to do. The forgiveness of sins that God has for me is, is available to all people. He redeemed us. He broke the power of sin and death on the cross. And we're like, it's like almost like part of it is, it's not all of it, but part of it is this visual that we needed to see that, yes, God loves us that much. Stop running away. And he's like, I want to reconcile you because I'm okay. It's either God needs to change or we need to change. And I promise you it's us. We move away from this isolation and into the darkness. So we keep running into darkness. So what sin does, sin keeps us underground. We want to hide. And God's like, no, don't hide. Because all you do when you go underground and you pretend to be something you're not, you go deeper and deeper in. And God's like, I need you to come out into the light. Not to be hurt, not to be judged, but to be loved and forgiven and, to, and, and you accept the forgiveness. You ever deal with someone who cannot forgive themselves? It's so frustrating. It's because their guilt and shame keeps them down, and they will not accept the forgiveness, and they continue to isolate themselves from you. It's like, I've forgiven you. Just come on. And they're like, no. You, you know, and they think of, uh, it's so frustrating. Don't let us be those people. That God says, I freely give of my forgiveness. It's by grace you are saved through faith. Nothing of yourselves is a gift of God. It's a gift that he gives freely. And yet we run from it. And Paul here says to this church in Colossians, this good news is that God loves you. And he's done everything to bring you to himself like a mama chicken bringing her chicks under her wing come on guys i don't know if you've ever seen things like that i think i was i don't know it was in the spring or something i saw this family of ducks on the bank of our house we got that the the pond down below and i think it was like a it must have been a cat or something coming and all of a sudden the duck they saw it, and you hear this quacking, like, wah, 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 wah. and the little guys just start dashing down the bank with Mama, right? And they're like, doop, doop, doop. you know, they're bouncing. I'm just like watching. I'm like, oh, this is catastrophic. They're all going to die. And the duck, the Mama duck gets to the bottom and just is quacking away, just going crazy, quacking, and she's looking at the bank. It was like I was watching this whole thing. It was, it was, it was amazing, right? And she's quacking and quacking and quacking, and sure enough, all of a sudden, you saw this little fuzzball pop out in the water. And then another one. And then pretty soon, all of them were back in a single file line, and Mommy took off. And they just started going. In the, and I'm like, that is so awesome. <laughs> that is so cool. And this is what God does. He's like, listen, I don't. <laughs> listen to my voice. Listen to me. Hear me calling you. Don't run away. You're going to die out there. Come to me. I'm going to protect you. I give you rest. And it's, it's not, you see those little ducks like bouncing down. It was kind of funny, but yet like a little scary. But it's not an easy necessarily trek down, you know. It's not necessarily easy, the road that God has for us. But it's a good road because at the bottom or at the top, however we look at it, he's there to protect us. Just just stop fighting, stop running, and turn. Let's pray. Lord, may our hearts be full 
of gladness. May we turn away from our desire <laughs> to turn away from you. Help us to run to you, not away from you. You have given us amazing love and mercy and grace, and may we turn to it. In Christ's name, amen. We're going to sing uh, Be Thou My Vision, first, second, and fourth. Thank you. today, um, following the voice of God, going out and loving and caring and doing the work that God has called us to do. God bless you all. See you next week.